Hello everyone, welcome to a new Process Mining Cafe. Uh, today we are talking about games and to be specific we are talking about game analytics and uh, for that we have invited uh, Maggie Saif El Nasra. Hi Maggie, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Absolutely, it's, uh, we are excited to hear about the research that uh, is going on in your team. You are a professor and department chair of uh, computational media at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And um, you have used process mining in, in game analytics, so we will hear much more about that uh, in just a moment. Great, yeah. Um, so, yeah. I'm excited to be here and excited to talk about the topic. Great, great, great. Um, before we get into that, though, I just want to remind you that you can talk to us while we are on the air. So um, just uh, on the same page where you are watching this right now, uh, below this video, you can join the chat. You can just uh, type your name. Uh, you don't need an account or a password or anything. Just type your name or any name and um, enter the chat and yeah, you can talk to us there and we will keep an eye on it and pick up your points throughout the session. Okay, so um, yeah, let's talk about games. So it's really a new topic and I'm very excited to hear more about uh, your research um, here because um, yeah, it's an, it's an, it's an, it's an, a big area. There's a lot going on in games. I myself, I just want to reveal from the start, I'm not Uh, much of a gamer at all. I have played in the 90s, maybe a little bit of Commander Keen, like a, there was a jump and run with my sister on the PC of our dad in the basement and a little bit of Sokoban, which is kind of a, you push around boxes in a warehouse. Uh, and apart from that, I'm really aware of it as a, as a cultural phenomenon. Eh? And you see a lot of things going on in this space and so I'm curious maybe before we go into the specific research what's your background with with games how did it come that you are doing research now in game game analytics yeah I think I guess I started very similar to you uh, so in the 90s I me and my brother would basically play and so we played a lot of the uh, narrative based games like the Sierra based games um, I guess King Quest and you know these are older like 90s type games um, and um, as we progressed um, through the years because we you know I moved to the US and and um, uh, got disconnected with my brother a little bit and also with my family we started to actually connect through games um, so my mom plays games and and she would call me sometimes at four o'clock in the morning asking me how do I solve this puzzle <laughs> uh, <laughs> time difference um, so if, to me games was part of how we connected and and kind of continued to be connected with family yeah. um, And it, it, I still play games, but not as much as I used to. So I still like and play games that are narrative based, like uh, Assassin's Creed, for example, is one of my favorite games from Ubisoft and um, and, and these type of like more narrative based games. I don't really play the Dota or the League of Legends. I get very addicted and I feel like this is gonna <laughs> not have me be productive in any other way. <laughs> Just play the game, um, which, which I think a lot of my students do. Yeah, and there's so many different games, right? So I'm just by, for example, listening to some podcasts or people from the games industry talking about it, I realize there, yeah, there are all kinds of really different games. I think people who are not into games sometimes have a very narrow um, understanding of the space and they think it's just kind of, you know, war games or something like that. It's not like that. That's really very broad. And we, we will see some, some, some examples um, later. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the field has been growing very uh, rapidly and there is a lot of different types of games and some people actually play a lot of games on the mobile devices like uh, Candy Crush or uh, or Angry Birds and sometimes they don't really think of them as games um, because they think of like games as like first person shooter type of games or, or games that are more immersive. Uh, but all of these are games that uh, ma many, many people play. Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, so you are uh, you have a group um, um, where you are doing research in, in different in different topics, but uh, one of them is game analytics. And so the things you are talking us will be showing us here today are, is based on the research from that team, right? You, should I bring up the yeah 
the slide, please. So, yeah, I want to to acknowledge the team. Uh, I have been working with many wonderful people. Some of them are alumni now, and some of them are still in the lab. Um, so the lab is called Game User Interaction Intelligence Lab, um, and they have several PhD students, postdocs, and um, some volunteers also in the lab. And the lab have been funded by um, by many different uh, organizations, as you can see. Um, so I'm. The work that I'm going to be discussing today is basically work that I've done with all of the people that you see here. Yeah, exactly. Great. And so you wanted to start by um, yeah, giving us a little bit of an overview and um, in introducing us a little bit to the space of games. And because um, some of the people who are watching might be yeah, familiar with process mining, but not know much about games. So to talk about game analytics, I think we have to talk about games first. So yeah, why, why don't you start there? Yeah, so uh, I wanted to actually uh, so, uh, show the different spectrums of games. So some of us know Candy Crush, and um, maybe if you're older enough, you know what Farmville means. Um, so I'm going to start with you, if you bring the slide with the uh, different series games. Um, so there is also the space of games that are beyond entertainment, games that are developed for a particular purposes, like an example is Endeavor RX, which got um, uh, FDA clearance to be used for uh, treating ADHD. Um, so that's a, a game that has been developed. Uh, it started at UCSF and kind of uh, moved on to for 10 years before they got the FDA clearance to be built for uh, a particular purpose. Uh, the second example that maybe some people know uh, is uh, America's Army, which uh, has been developed back, uh, I think, maybe in the 90s also. Um, and it's now being used for recruitment and training. Um, and another example is um, uh, Dragon Box, which is uh, a game that's now being introduced in some schools as well in Europe and, and in the US to teach uh, math, um, uh, algebraic math, how to, uh, to learn algebra uh, through a game. Um, so that's, again, a game that's used in the, in the schools, not particularly people are uh, uh, my, uh, people might be able to uh, get to it from websites or, or on mobile, but it's, uh, it's an important game that's been developed for education. Uh, another interesting one is the uh, game called Fold It, which was uh, developed as a way to uh, solve protein structures, and it had a, a success in uh, HIV and other type. And actually, they used it for COVID as well. So it basically is allowing people to um, solve puzzles around protein structures. Uh, so instead of the computer um, using machine learning to kind of solve the protein structure, we have now people are, uh, you know, solving these puzzles to solve protein structures. And they have been a lot more successful using that crowdsourcing techniques or games as a crowdsourcing techniques than um, machine learning or, or uh, other approaches. So uh, these are just example games that are just beyond the entertainment that has been around and, and people are using them. Some of them are um, older than, uh, than the 90s. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so these are, if I see this correctly, are educational games, but also yeah, ways to use human resources, right? Like in this, I think this crowdsourcing example is really interesting. So it's basically yeah, getting people to help by making, making it interesting for them to mm -hmm. gamify in a good way, let's say. The the other uh, spectrum now, uh, also a lot of people probably know about esports. Um, there is a lot of events that are happening um, uh, around um, around that concept. So uh, esports is like sports, but is digital. So you, they use uh, games like uh, Dota, League of Legends, um, uh, and other types of games where people kind of compete in teams. Um, and so it's been uh, it's been interesting to see that how that evolves over time. Now, every university, at least um, and the universities that I've been in, have teams uh, or, that are competing nationally within, uh, the, I guess, the US or internationally. Um, so it's become a very big movement. And it's interesting because there is a lot of collaboration because it's a team based, just like sports, uh, team based sports. Um, so there's a lot of collaboration between the team members. There's a lot of group work and and uh, a lot of hard work to kind of understand how to be better at the game to to compete in that level. 
Yeah. Are there, I'm curious, are there particular games that uh, are very uh, popular in this area? Are there also kind of, let's say, sports, real sports in esports, let's say, or is it mostly uh, teams playing games that are competitive against each other? They are, uh, I mean, the number of games is probably expanding. Um, so uh, for now, I, I know there are like maybe 10, 12 games like uh, um, I mentioned Dota and League of Legends. And these are real-time strategy games. So mm. they, um, you play in a team and you cannot compete with the other team, but it's not, it's not like soccer or other yeah. types of sports. It's very strategy-based. Um, Now, I, I don't know if they're going to get into like virtual cricket or virtual uh, <laughs> soccer. Um, there are, uh, a, 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 soccer also has a virtual and fantasy based uh, uh, aspects to it too. Um, uh, but I, uh, for the esports competitions, most of it is uh, uh, specific games that the industry, um, uh, um, there are specific companies that basically support to make sure that, um, you know, it's fair and there is no cheating there is a lot of things that has to go into effect it's, it's harder than um i guess it's a harder industry than the uh the actual sports industry because the sports industry's rules are very simple but mm -hmm. for this one the rules are also evolving yeah fascinating yes thank you Yeah, so this is, just, I wanted to just give you a spectrum of what, when we talk about games, there's so many different types of games. And so when we start to think about analytics, there's also a lot of different analytics that people use for uh, esports that's going to be different than what people would use for an educational game or for a, a game for health or for other applications. And, and some of it um, are more standardized methods and some of it are may not. Um, and there is, as you can imagine, uh, with analytics for games there is a lot more contextual details because you know what actions are people people are doing and what's the context behind this action especially with the uh, team space sports like esports mm -hmm. we know that these team are trying to compete with that with that team they they are going to be using specific strategies there is a lot of different immersion behaviors like uh, ganking or baiting behaviors so there's a lot of terms already to strategies that already exist uh, that people are using in in these forms yeah and when we talk about analytics are these analytics being used by the designers of those games or also by the players um, so the analytics is, is interesting because it's, there is a lot of different uses for analytics in games. Um, there are analytics that are used for monetization to just figure out how to uh, make the game uh, make money. Um, so we, we're, they are basically going to be interested in, in things like retention and, uh, and how conversions of users happen. Uh, but then there is also analytics that are used for um, how to make the team better in esports for example so um, looking at stats for the teams for the characters what characters to choose and how to to balance out the team that kind of thing um, there's also um, um, stats for strategies for uh, games lost won, and and um, and all of that is all part of the analytics for esports uh, when we talk about Narrative-based games, there's different types of analytics involved. Um, so I, I have several slides I can show some examples of um, analytics, but they are used again for different kinds of games. So uh, a good example is um, uh, in, in this slide, as you can see, uh, this is like looking at... Um, um, so this is used by designers for level design specifically for how to design the maps for uh, this particular game is Assassin's Creed. Um, and the idea was that they wanted to make sure that the map is open and players can go around in different parts of the map. So in one iteration, the one that you see on your left, um, is um, uh, for the first uh, first iteration May 18th, I think. This is when they uh, tested this. So they can, you can see a lot more red areas, which means a lot of congestion in the map. Um, and so uh, they used basically just movement data to kind of plot this uh, and as, as a heat map to kind of see uh, the hotter the areas are, the more congestion and more people are in it. Um, so they wanted to, to spread the map a little bit where they can open it up Uh, so the designers kind of worked on it and by June 22nd they tried to look at the data again and you can see less 
hot areas so uh, the map kind of opened up a little bit where people can go into different areas so this could be um, a one way where a game like assassin's creed which uh, which is a game that requires a lot of navigation in space uh, and virtual maps and uh, and um, elements of level design where where designers have to think about how to create these maps and and ways and wayfinding within the maps um, they can use data like that with heat maps to kind of show how where people are going um, maybe there are places where they need to pick up specific quests or specific information is important for the game that nobody has gone in <laughs> uh, so they might be able to see that and maybe there is a wayfinding issue that they could adjust design wise mm -hmm. so that that's a particular type of design uh, that could could use these particular maps, mm -hmm. uh, but there. But the analytics could be used for different types of designs. It could also be used by players, as we could see with the esports example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think the other example that that is actually kind of yeah, the, what you mentioned before, right? That it can also be used to increase activity. The Farmville example. Yeah. yeah. So the Farmville example is a um, uh, farm. Uh, well, Farmville is a Facebook-based uh, game, right? So you want to have uh, more people. They are more interested. So uh, we talked about the business analytics. So like how to business, how to make money with the game, or when to put promotions in the game to drive more customers in. So you could look at a graph like that, which shows you where how many users are in per day, um, uh, how many sessions, and so forth, and you. You can see where dips are um, and maybe this is when you want to introduce some marketing uh, type of technique um, and you can also see what happens on vacation days <laughs> and and when people actually uh, have more traffic on the game or not um, and that might drive decisions about marketing it might drive decisions about even design if you want to um, uh, for for games that are like on on the web it's easy for them to basically add um, a, a new um, element in the game or adjust the game or add a new episode for the game and so forth so that decisions could also all be made um, through data uh, and yeah. most of the time it is now yeah maybe so one thing I'm curious about um, for these types of business analytics that um, basically are about um, yeah for example increasing the activity level that people have I mean in the media there are sometimes concerns about for example that one can get addicted and these kind of things is there an awareness and, and like a discussion of ethics in the analytics community are you aware of that yeah there is a, a large discussion of ethics and data um, uh, that ha happens every year at, at the game developers conference which is mm -hmm. happen happening in march um, there are several game developers conference now right so there is the big one that happens in san francisco and there's also another one that happens in dubai um, there are a number of people that are leading the discussion about ethics especially when we're seeing a lot of behavioral issues um, uh, so there, there, there are discussions, there are already known uh, issues with some of the methods that are used specifically for uh, retention um, uh, that might cause addiction. Uh, but there are also discussions about uh, what should we do about it? Like how can that, how can we regulate that, right? So uh, how can we um, uh, maybe as responsible game developers um, <laughs> address uh, that particular issue? Uh, there might be also, uh, I mean, there is a lot of, uh, work that I do with game analytics is specifically for design, how to design the game better. Um, uh, so if it's game for for um, for education, you do want to have people playing the game. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the games for education sometimes do not get as much people playing and for, not for as long as they want to. Um, so um, so we're, we're far from <laughs> making a lot of educational games that are very, very addictive, but there are games that can become addictive. And, and it is an, an issue that a lot of people uh, in the minds of a lot of people and so um, um, they're talking about regulations of the industry as well at some point so um, and there are books about uh, addiction and issues with data and ethical issues with data as well that also hits the game analytics side right yeah it's a really interesting point that's like yeah something that 
yeah, maybe one doesn't think about it. One only thinks about the, that addictive can be bad, but that strategies, like you say, with these educational games, that's yeah, that's a really interesting angle I didn't think about before. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so I think I had a slide to discuss like how important um, games are to bi uh, data is to businesses within either games or serious games or the, the marketing games, just like with all the other businesses that they have been using data for for a while. Also, the game industry, um, maybe around the 2007 or or, or 10 time frame, uh, has started to uh, get more and more. Um, uh, methods that uh, look into data as part of their uh, process. Um, and that data doesn't have to be very player-oriented data. We're talking about maybe even data in their production and their, uh, about their servers, uh, their their software production cycle, uh, so that they can be make the uh, workflow better. Um, and so data could be part of all of the production, not just the um, how do we make the game better, right? So it could also be in uh, how do we make the production cycle better? How do we make the processes, the systems better? Um, and that has been start has started to become more of a process um and in our first book about game analytics that's back into th published in 2013 um back in 2011 we kind of saw, saw that movement in the industry where there's a big shift of like um now we're thinking about design from a data-driven perspective now we're also thinking about how do we embed data as a component that may help designers, maybe players and others. Um, so we started a book uh, to um ask all of the different people people in the business at that time to discuss what the where do they use data and where do they see it um, as a um, successful method for uh, uh, for their the value of their business uh, so we came up with the uh, with that book which has many different chapters to just um, uh, from different industries we had several interviews with different people who have been using uh, data at the time uh, to discuss different values of data for the industry um, and different types of industry. So we also had serious games as well as entertainment games uh, represented in the book. Uh, and then in uh, like few years ago, we started also another book to basically uh, um, target now that we have had almost 10 years of using games in the industry, what can we uh, distill as methods that are now more standardized? Um, and that's the textbook that uh, we developed called Game Data Science that has uh, techniques that people use. Um, most of the techniques are around machine learning and um, for analysis and, and some are qualitative in nature as well. So there's a lot of knowledge engineering and human in the loop uh, processes. Um, but we, ha but I think our team have been the first to basically look at process-based techniques. Um, and um, uh, back in 2000, uh, in about 2015, we looked at that and we started to look at visualization methods for uh, process-based techniques, which we felt was important because, uh, as I said, we are interested in the design side. Like, how do we improve the design? Um, and a lot of it ha comes back to what the process that the players are doing and understanding that process a little bit better so that we can see what the flaws in the design are and how to address these. Yeah, exactly. And this brings us to uh, your first process mining uh, example, right, where you applied process mining actually in, in the line of this kind of process oriented uh, analytics research. Yeah, so this, um, uh, the example I'm going to discuss is um, collaboration with uh, um, with several people. So uh, several organizations, um, the Maternity Foundation, as well as Benchy AI, um, uh, and it's funded by Bill Melinda Gates uh, Foundation. Um, the, ap the application here is not really a game. It's basically an application that is uh, developed uh, called Safe Delivery, um, that is developed to get people certified for uh, delivery babies uh, and is specifically um, uh, targeted for Africa and Asia. Um, 
and it has kind of like up to date uh, guidelines of how uh, the different things that you need to do in order to uh, get specific procedures done. Um, the so it's an application that has multiple different um, options. You can have, go to action. You can see videos. You can see uh, actions like written down to of things that you need to do uh, in terms of guidelines. And you also can do like um, tests, like small quizzes to kind of test your knowledge uh, or know where uh, maybe you don't know specific knowledge about specific things. And you also can get certified through this application. Um, so we worked with uh, Ben. Benchy, and Benchy basically collected a lot of data from Maternity Foundation um, uh, through that particular app. And they were doing a lot of machine learning techniques. And we came in to basically look into how does process-based approaches uh, help, whether that's process mining or uh, process visualizations and how that could be helpful from, uh, for the design or for uh, even understanding what, how learning has happened. Um, so that was um, an interesting example uh, because we started to look into various ways that we can expand process-oriented approaches. So I have a slide here that basically uh, shows what, um, like, uh, what's a process approach looks like. So if you use Disco and, and we use Disco for this one, um, we basically can see uh, what people do in this in an application like that. How, where do they spend their time? How do they pr uh, progress from? Um, uh, to be certified, for example? Do they do a lot of videos and then get certified or how do they get certified? And we found that some people actually don't get certified and don't are not interested in getting certified. Maybe they are doctors looking at just the guidelines and interested in that. Um, and so we started to look at ways of segmenting the users based on their behaviors. Uh, so what you see in the slide here are just two different uh, groups of users, a, a user group that basically was very um, targeted towards certifying, so they really need wanted to get certified, <laughs> and others that just didn't care. And so you could see that their um, actions are very different. Um, and, and by definition, they would not, the ones that ignored the certification did not do any certification work, but they also spent their time in different uh, in different things within the uh, applications. Um, one thing that we found from the people who are very concentrated on the certification is the loop between getting certified and, and or doing the certification and then going back to the learning. What we found is that most people actually concentrate on figuring out what they need to learn. <laughs> so they get certification first, go through the certification first to see, figure out where which videos should I concentrate on and then go back to the videos so that they can learn what they need to learn in order to get certified, which is a pattern that we saw uh, quite often. And you can see it in terms of uh, how much time is spent on the certification versus the other aspects of the application for the people who are interested in passing the certification. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. And and when we yeah when we talked about this, right, you mentioned that these types of segmentations uh, are really good aspect to use process mining for because that's one of the things that process mining is really good at to um, yeah make segmentations of data not just based on a particular attribute that's there or not there but based on behavior based on certain sequential patterns that people are following so so that's a, that's a nice example of that yeah especially crucial for um, uh, things like learning if you are interested in how how do i make the application for learning better uh, you want to know where are people struggling so struggling behavior becomes important so you can look at people who struggled in this area people didn't struggle in this area and what their behaviors are and how their behaviors are different maybe you can then learn how to coach other people who are struggling uh, from what people have been doing who are not struggling um, so that's an, another way to kind of see processes and segment users and, and get more out of it yeah right <laughs> so uh, for another example huh? should we look at the the next sure, example? yeah, we can look at the next example. So then the next example is actually, um, uh, this is actually where we started with uh, process mining uh, or process approaches. Um, so one of the things that we started to look into back in 2013 was a game that was um, 
uh, again, it's a learning game that was developed to teach algebraic math uh, called One Step Trouble, developed by uh, Brainquake. Um, and what's interesting is that, uh, oh, this is the, the, the glyph slide. I'm still on that glyph slide. So <laughs> what's interesting with that game is that when they first started, they, they didn't, um, you know, when, when you first start a game like that, you sometimes you might be putting a lot of puzzles that may be too hard for people. And this is this was a game that was developed for uh, middle school uh, kids. Um, and so um, what we were looking at is pacing, like how how easy what were people able to get through the puzzles and how is that different from one level to the next. Um, and uh, so we developed a visualization um, back then that we didn't have Disco to actually use. So uh, we developed a visualization called Glyph. And, and Glyph has a, um, similar to uh, Disco, it has a graph where it basically shows the process where um, you can see there the, the blue node is where everybody started. Uh, the red is an ending for the game. Um, and the path through is basically what people, the actions that people took to go from start to end. Uh, so you could see from the state graph there that you have three endings. So the game could end in three different ways. Um, but the most dominant one is the one that is the biggest. Uh, and you can see that path is just two actions to get to the end. Um, but then you also can see that people have solved it in different ways. So we wanted to preserve that. So the way that we wanted to preserve that was we thought, well, why don't we have another window that allows us to cluster how people solve this level so that we can see uh, if people struggled, if people solved, uh, solved it in different ways, how many people solved it in different ways, uh, are these dominant patterns or not. Uh, so uh, the, uh, when we developed the sequence graph that allows us to then cluster these um, different sequences, we are able to then see how different uh, and maybe diverse strategies were to solve the particular level that, are, that is there. It also allowed us for other levels that were very hard to see how hard that is and how many people have actually uh, not been able to solve that level when it's uh, that hard. So we can address issues of pacing. Um, and if you look at the other slide, um, what we developed with Glyph is a way for interactions where we can um, click on a, um, a uh, basically a node in the sequence graph that we think is a, uh, is a big sequence, like everybody did that. And then we can see what that sequence looks like in the other graph. Uh, and then we can also compare and contrast. So if we want to look at what these other solutions look like, we can also compare people in the other clusters, uh, and then we can see what the process that they had were. Uh, so that allows us to a little bit play around with the data to understand uh, the differences and again, Again, get at the segmentation issue if we want to want to segment these groups different from the others so that we can compare them. Uh, the clustering approach with the process mining approach was, uh, or the process visualization approach was actually important for us to use. Yeah, yeah. and that's developed in your in your group, right? This. Uh... Yeah, that's a software that we developed back in 2013 <laughs> and we were testing it. I think it's published in 2015. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, so I think um, now we are having another process mining example as well, right? Yep. So. Um, uh, process mining could be used in multiple different ways, as you can see from the examples that we just discussed, um, looking at problem solving patterns or looking at learning patterns. Um, <clears throat> we had another game that was uh, actually a hard game uh, to play. Uh, it's a game that was developed by Drexel University to uh, help people understand parallel programming. Uh, and so if you know parallel programming, you know it is hard by itself. <laughs> so we, we thought making a game, or they thought making a game would actually make it easier for them to learn um, and um, it might also make it 
en more engaging. Uh, so the game here, this is a complex level where basically you're, um, uh, you have different threads that are going to be moving through the different parts. You can think about them as different segments of the program, and you want to protect a segment that are, uh, you know, writing to the same variable, for example. Uh, and you do that by um, uh, by blocking, uh, as, uh, letting one thread through and blocking the rest, for example. Uh, and you do that by semaphores, and you kind of uh, uh, lock the semaphore and then release the semaphore after the thread goes through. Um, so what the, what you see in these uh, in the game is the threads are the uh, arrows that are moving forward, um, and the uh, uh, things that were being placed are basically blocks and semaphores. So to uh, let uh, threads in and release uh, and release the blocks so that other threads can come into that segment. Um, so that's the basic idea: is that it's um, a game where you're visually seeing uh, parallel programming and is able to understand constructs like um, uh, like semaphores and threads and and all of that within um, a context of a game. Um, now the game is st was still hard <laughs> uh, for people to play. Um, so what we wanted to look into is uh, look into a uh, a way to. Um, uh, understand the process and then build in visualizations that we can make other people see and then they'll be able to say, for example, if they are struggling in that level, they'll, they'll see another person who's struggling in the same way and we can show a visualization of their process and how they solved uh, the, the level. That way they can uh, rethink how they are solving their level. That may help uh, them kind of understand different ways of thinking about the same problem. Uh, that's the that was the idea, uh, but in order for us to get there, we started to think about well, how do we, uh, how do you, how do we build in visualizations that other people understand? Um, now, not all visualizations in, uh, that are produced by process mining algorithms or process visualizations are very easy and and, sim and, and simple. Uh, so sometimes they can be very cluttered and maybe not very understandable for other people. So we had to go through a way of analyzing the data to uh, distill um, aspects of the process that we can then visualize for other people. Um, and so we used uh, process mining as an approach for us to do that. So that's one of the, that's the other slide where we basically um, uh, um, took what you saw in the game there, basically uh, did a process, a visualization of what's what are people doing with multiple people going through the same game. Um, and then we are seeing what is a popular type of uh, semaphores that are added or links that are added. Um, and what do these links and these particular actions led to? Is it like, a, uh, did they solve the level or did they get stuck? Uh, so we can then, um, if you go to the next slide, you can see that um, we kind of, uh, using process mining, we're able to uh, kind of collect uh, actions that were good, actions that maybe led to issues, um, and kind of separate them uh, so that we can figure out how do we go from raw, raw data to uh, an abstraction that other people, when I show it to other people, they'll maybe basically understand, oh, he did that particular action and I can just do that in my, uh, in my play and that will help me kind of solve the level. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah, what I find really interesting here is, is um, yeah, the, the the what you're describing is to find the right level, right, of representing the behavior. Because what you're describing is that you want to reflect the behavior of the people in the game. How do they address? Uh, what strategy do they have? How which steps they are taking in the game? And then some strategies are successful, others are not, like we just saw in the video. But yeah, so how do you represent that? Even if we go one back, how do you get to a process map like that? Right? It's it's not there automatically, but you have to basically find a representation. So maybe can you give an example, like one of these nodes, for example, JY to DY is, would this be like one move or placing something or there's yeah. a certain level of encoding already happening here, right? Yeah, 
Yeah, there's a lot of encoding that's already happening from the raw data. So it's basically building a link from D to I and then maybe moving a semaphore from... Uh, so these are either putting a link or, or putting a semaphore in one particular location. And there is also... Um, so we split the map that you saw with the game into specific regions. Uh, so this is what D is, I is. So it, when you connect uh, um, a semaphore on, for example, D with a link on an I, that means DI, that's a link between these two regions in, in the game map. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you can think about that concept of uh, linking and, and game map uh, uh, abstraction also happening in multiple different games where you have different zones that mean different things. So in, in parallel programming, a zone is, is could be like a critical section that you can't go, you, you have only it can, should be protected, only specific threads need to go into it, uh, maybe one thread at a time, that kind of thing. Um, there might be other zones that are uh, different, have different functions. In, in different games, you'll have maybe different types of zones for different reasons. So that abstraction helps us understand the, the differences in the different zones and not just think about it as X, Y, Z position in space, which if I, if I had put all of the raw data as like X, Y positions in a, in a 2D map, then you would not get <laughs> uh, yeah. that kind of visualization. It would be a lot more cluttered. Yeah, exactly. It reminds me a little bit. It's like similar. If you're looking at geo uh, location data, sometimes there are processes where something is moved. I don't know, in a supermarket, things are moved around or how people move there. Yeah, it would be way too detailed to analyze that. You have to abstract it. So I think yeah, having zones like you made here could also be something to deploy in such a scenario right or i think right. once there was a robot soccer so also there they are moving so you have to have some kind of aggregation there yeah 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 and maybe the zones could be also dynamic depending on when where the ball is for soccer for example yeah. might be important or who's playing and the, who the other team members are so um in in our case the game is simple so it's a, a very static uh, zone-based system, but uh, in other games it might be more complicated or in other situations. I imagine for a supermarket situation it might actually also be just static, but de depending on if they change uh, where they put different things, they might have to change the zone uh, uh, association as well. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, so the, to, to make sure we understand like the next step, so the next step was that also some further aggregation or was it more like putting the strategies together on this chosen level of abstraction to see which one are the ones that are successful and which are the ones that are not? Yeah, so it's it's basically the latter. So you uh, you we we were trying to figure out which ones were successful, and which ones are not, which ones are are, are similar, because mm -hmm. what we are interested in doing is that uh, if you are struggling. Uh, we want to find somebody who's struggling in a similar way, <laughs> uh, but has advanced a little bit more than you, right? Um, or has struggled and figured out how a way, uh, uh, you know, out of that struggle. Um, so that means that I need to know similarities between people who are struggling and, and not just knowing what is the, the uh, correct strategy and what's the not correct strategy. I want to coach people through through their, their thinking process, right? And this is why you have different... Um, different groupings of different types of actions that may or may not be successful. Yeah, yeah really interesting. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and then the next step from there is that's not I'm not showing it because we're still kind of working on it. But the idea is that uh, uh, we will be showing a process visualization. So the player will be playing, and then they'll struggle, and then they will have a hint system where they basically say, "Okay, I I don't know what to do next," and they will click on a hint, and the hint will say, "Okay, you're struggling with this part. Uh, look at these three people, and they you can um, uh, look at their process, but then you can also play playback specific parts of the process. Uh, so there would be a playback system uh, to the game. So it contextualizes a little bit more what DI and what, because for, for us, DI means something, but for the player, it would not. Um, so it would be uh, important for us to kind of visualize the contextual details. So uh, so they will have playbacks of different people who, are, who they want to investigate further. Yeah, yeah, great. So not just to, yeah, improve the game in a static way, but to yeah, to really give 
give feedback to the player while they are playing it themselves. Yeah. Yeah, that's also important for like esports because with esports it's competitive play and and most people do a lot of training and and probably the same thing with with the regular sports, right? You look at videos of how you did uh, in in the in the match and maybe uh, how others uh, that you may be facing are doing, and then you're learning from these videos. We try to use. Uh, process visualizations uh, techniques to allow you to look at not just one match or two matches, but a lot of people's uh, data rather than just, uh, you know, very simple uh, um, one or two uh, data sets. But I think um, you can always play back to that level of like, I want to just see that match or that particular uh, moment and how one person has, has uh, solved that or how the team has solved that. Yeah, actually, that, that reminds me, there was one example once where someone applied process mining to analyze not uh, robot or esports soccer, but real soccer. And they had the, the same challenge, basically to find the right level of abstraction of representing the process in a way that it's meaningful that yeah a player could derive something useful from that. So they tried different kind of views and we'll include that with uh, with all the other links and your books and the things we mentioned in the in the show notes for people to take a look at. Yeah, abstraction is always an interesting ex uh, exercise. <laughs> and yeah. there are a lot of different ways to do that by hand, but there, there are also maybe some ways or tools to help uh, with, with, uh, with to help people basically build better models that are abstracting from the low, low level data. Yeah. Uh, you brought one other application of uh, process mining as well, right? The next one? Yeah, so the next one, uh, talking about abstraction, so the next one basically uh, looks at group uh, team-based activities. So this is an alternate reality game that we developed where uh, groups talk to each other on Discord and kind of uh, collaborate to solve specific puzzles that move them um, or their team uh, um, to, towards solving the whole game. Um, Alternate reality games are basically played in, in, in physical real life as well as in um, in virtual life. Uh, and we're using Discord as a method to uh, have the team basically communicate, very similar to other types of games where the chat is, is a big component. Um, for, uh, for that game, what we did is that we use process mining to understand how the team is working together because we wanted to, we were interested in like teamwork, um, um, how they coordinated, how they collaborated, how they planned together, and also how do they uh, encourage or discourage each other, how they um, uh, cope with difficulties uh, as a team. Um, and so we use a, a pro, uh, um, uh, for abstraction, we basically use the theory from team-based uh, performance uh, literature or organizational literature to take all of the raw uh, text data and then um, build up these uh, labels like this is a coordination, this is they found a cue or the, they were um, uh, mutually monitoring the situation or they, they, they expressed confusion, um, they were doing some kind of emotion regulation or they were were uh, uh, waiting for a hint or asking for a hint and so forth. So we um, put together these labels for, based on contextual details of the game as well as a, a team performance theory. And we plotted their process to see where are things that they that this pro they they were working together as a team based on uh, team based methods. Uh, they were coordinating or uh, or there were aspects of emotions like they expressed confusion or they were. Uh, express positive emotions or negative emotions and so forth and uh, that's a, that was one way for us to see how the team kind of worked together and how they um, encouraged each other um, and the idea is that we wanted to see that uh, in process as that so the uh, alternate reality games are usually played over weeks um, and uh, this particular game was developed to be played over a month um, and um, I think for our Play testing. We just play tested it for two weeks, uh, and within the two weeks, we we're able to collect the data, 
do the process. Uh, my, the idea is to pro do the process visualizations and see where the team is struggling and maybe intervene as they as the game is going. <laughs> uh, we didn't get to intervene, but we were, we were able to basically get to the point of like seeing where encouragement, for example, happens, as you can see from the slide here. Um, and if we see a lot of discouragement, we might be giving hints. So we have uh, characters that are uh, bots that we control that uh, allows us to send uh, uh, encouragement method uh, uh, messages or maybe do uh, specific things in the game to kind of help players along um, uh, maybe give them hints and so forth uh, so we use these bots or different uh, elements in the game to kind of help us uh, uh, adapt the game a little bit based on the data that we are processing yeah. It's interesting. All, all these process maps, they they mean something different, right? So there's a different, very different process behind this one, where it's really the, the team collaboration and how people interact. And so it's, yeah. But it's yeah, still... we're hoping... Uh, we're hoping that this could become at some point like a community um, a community based technique or tools where um, uh, games like that have a lot big community co uh, um, aspect to them could be you could use these different visualizations for either community managers to uh, help them um, help the com help different users in different ways uh, maybe even to spot issues of uh, bullying or other maybe ne more negative issues before they become a bigger problem uh, because now there there are games that are being played for a lot longer than just <laughs> a few minutes, right? Um, and they have a whole community with uh, uh, around them. And I, uh, having these type of tools that allows us to help the community managers in their job will actually be important. Um, but we don't talk about that as much uh, because there aren't a lot of tools for community managers to use. And uh, I think uh, process approaches or process visualization, process mining might become uh, if we are able to, to uh, generate these maps quicker might yeah. become a, an approach to do that yeah in some kind of automated way right so um, uh, how did you do did you did you do some kind of manual um, co encoding probably right it's probably hard or did you do some kind of sentiment detection we did sentiment detection. It wasn't as good <laughs> as we wanted it, especially that uh, false positives and false negatives might be a very a might be problematic in 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 this case um so we did a lot of things by hand uh, at this time the idea is that maybe now that we have a lot of labeled data we could actually start using um uh, some of the nlp technologies and and we have a lot of collaborators that are working with us on that yeah interesting it's kind of a whole separate research area again in a way yep <laughs> we have a big a group in the lab so each one is <laughs> is uh, getting their own space yeah. okay so well maybe maybe that's a great way to close so tell us a little bit about the current challenges and and what your team is is, is up to at the moment so the car, a, a big challenge is the abstraction, which we hinted on uh, in multiple different examples throughout. And and in the last case, you could see that we are actually spending a lot of time actually doing a lot of labeling ourselves. Um, so if without abstractions, things can become very, uh, very hard to visualize, especially for games uh, where it's uh, very complex behaviors. Even for the very simple games, um, they may, may become really out of hand. Like a, yeah, you, an you example is here. here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and, and it gets worse than that um, as well. Uh, so this is a, a, a graph that shows the process if we just give it uh, some, some raw data. Uh, so we need to, uh, in order for us to clean it up and, and see the, the processes the way that I showed in the other gra in the other uh, graphs that you so you've seen. We need to do a lot more abstraction. Most of the time, this is happening um, through knowledge engineering and through uh, human in the loop, basically building these models. Um, but maybe there are other ways to do this. Uh, there might be other uh, approaches to either help the human do it, so tools that allows the uh, the human in the loop to become better and more be more efficient, or maybe there are tools 
tools that automate part of the process. Um, NLP is not there yet to do the what we wanted uh, uh, with the um, data that we labeled for the team-based work, but maybe it will be, and maybe there are uh, aspects of it that we could uh, use that will get the human part of the uh, the way there, and then the human can continue. Um, I, I mentioned, I mean, I have the slide of Glyph again, um, because I feel like uh, uh, ha uh, what we did with the um, um, clustering approach allowed us to get a little bit more um, uh, understanding of the different um, uh, different processes are happening. And that might be a one way to think about the clutter. So maybe if you have millions of players playing, uh, they're not, they're all going to probably play differently. Uh, but um, uh, you can still cluster and be able to see how different they are without losing too much of the uh, issues of the diversity. Because I, uh, what we are trying to do in the in our lab is also to uh, see um, patterns that are uh, maybe unique to one or two people. If, for example, if one person is struggling in the in in the learning application or in the game, we still want to make sure that we see that person that's struggling. So sometimes the one-off uh, or uh, the the noise might be still important for us to actually uh, conserve. Um, so one way that we're doing this is through the clustering. So maybe, in, as you can see for, in, the, in that slide with Glyph, there are like four people that solved, and, uh, solved, it, solved the puzzle very differently in the very uh, top um, left of the sequence graph there. Um, but maybe these four people would be noise in, in, in a machine learning uh, approach. But for us, it's still, they're still important and they're good to kind of conserve them. So we use clustering for that approach to basically make sure that we um, we make sure that to conserve the diversity of the data that we have rather than just uh, throwing away some outliers or or noise yeah yeah that's uh, that's a good point yeah it's not about finding just the main strategy but it's really to about understanding the diverse behavior that there is on the right level of abstraction right right yeah yeah and how do you see kind of the relation between those types of abstractions and then process mining? I mean, in the way, process mining can be applied on every level, right? You could just apply it on the raw data. If it's too raw, it's probably going to be spaghetti, like we just saw. Yeah. Um, yeah. If, if you have abstracted very much, maybe it's very streamlined, but there can be every level in between. So I think that's also interesting to have these kind of, yeah. Yeah, I think... That yeah, yeah, I think, uh, uh, I mean, process mining is a great tool to be applied to multiple levels of these. So depending on where you are with the with the abstraction, there's also different types of abstractions, right? So, um, uh, so you want to keep all of these into uh, the spectrum when you're when you're working on a uh, on a particular problem. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm really curious also what comes. What comes next with this? So you mentioned that at the moment it's an internal uh, tool that you're developing, but maybe in the future it will also be available uh, for other researchers. So yeah, so then um, maybe other people could also try it out, and we will we will keep you all posted on what's happening in the game analytics community and how process mining has been applied there. We will link everything that uh, that we have discussed. Um, yeah, are there are there any specific things that that you're curious about or yeah maybe you can see where process mining could could help or anything you want to to ask the community perhaps well i would be uh, happy to to learn or and and also uh, know if anybody is actually using um process approaches in games or have thought about uh, doing uh, doing that or have uh, also looked at the abstraction. The abstraction problem is not really particular to games, right? It's also right. A, a problem that is uh, um, using pro for using process mining in any of the applications that you've been using, especially like web-based uh, or, or digital type of um, uh, applications on mobile devices and so forth. Great. All right. Thanks. Thanks so much, Maggie, for for joining us for sharing this. Uh, it was really really nice to see. You. Thanks a lot. Thank you.
Yeah, nice to see, nice to see you, and nice to be here as well. I'm, I'm very glad to have had that opportunity. Great, great. All right. Thanks also to all of you uh, for for watching, for joining us again for for this Prosmanning Cafe. We will be back in four weeks uh, with another Prosmanning Cafe about uh, measures and targets uh, on the 29th of March. Um, see you then. Bye bye. <laughs>